In this video, we're going to completely disassemble and clean this Nintendo 64 model NUS001. Here's a quick look at the supplies that I will use for this project. Starting out we have a plastic cup for small pieces, some Windex, lighter feel, 91 and 99% IPA, Dawn dish soap, an iFixit project mat, prying assortment, and tool kit. First step in disassembly will be getting the unit turned over and removing the six 4.5 millimeter case screws. Now that the screws are out, we can go ahead and take off both of the lower front case feet. The N64 jumper pack will need to be removed before the case can be split. After that, we can go ahead and pull off the top of the console and get our first look at the condition of the internals. In my experience, this is pretty normal. I do see some pet hair, dust, dirt, but luckily, no corrosion or any obvious damage. Using a Phillips head bit, it is now time to take 10 of the 14 screws out that hold the aluminum heat sink in place. After these are all removed, we'll go ahead and take out the final four holding the heatsink in place. Again, it's very important to stay organized so you know where each of these screws goes during reassembly. The heatsink can now be removed and we'll come back to clean this later in the video. As we've seen, this console does have some pet hair, dirt, and debris, but I've had to clean way worse out of other console cleanings that I've done. Here we are removing the three Phillips head screws that hold the tin plates to the expansion port slot. The three small tin shields are now good to be removed from the system. In order to remove the top tin circuit board cover, we'll need to remove the seven Phillips head screws. Again, it's important to note here that the five side screws are short and the two screws next to the cartridge slot are a little bit longer. The last four screws that need to be removed for disassembly are those of the power port and the video connection. The main board can now lift straight out of the console and you will notice around the video connection there is another trim bezel that can also be removed. The lower tin can also be removed as well as these two lower brackets. The last piece of the lower case to be disassembled is this power light surround. Now we need to make a decision. This lower case does need to be cleaned. If we decide to submerge the entire piece, this barcode with serial number will be lost. Getting started on disassembling the top of the case, we will first need to remove this reset button. By depressing these two clips and using a small flathead screwdriver, you can push the button from the case. Remember the reset button was stuck. Typically that can be fixed by removing the button, cleaning it, and the area of the case in which it sits. Moving to the other side of the case, we'll depress the clips and remove the on-off switch. Now it's time to remove the two Phillips head screws that hold on the internal cartridge slot surround. As seen here, it's typical that this piece does accumulate quite a bit of dirt and grime. The last part of disassembly for the upper case is the removal of the cartridge slot doors. As seen here, when removed, each of these doors does contain a spring. 
With very little effort, these springs will compress and you can remove them from the doors. For the purposes of cleaning, this unit is disassembled as far as we need to go. As I mentioned, I feel it's very important to stay organized when doing any electronics project. Almost as important as liking this video and subscribing to my channel. The easiest way I've found to clean cases is to simply submerge them in soap and water and use a scrub brush. We'll use a similar method for the smaller bits and clean with an old toothbrush. The aluminum heatsink I'll be cleaning with a paper towel and Windex. As you can see, this part was quite dirty. The upper and lower tin shields will get the same treatment, and again, depending on how dirty the council is, the time spent on cleaning these parts will vary. It's also worth mentioning to use caution as some of these edges can be quite sharp. The jumper pack will also get a quick wipe down with Windex, and then we'll clean the pins with a Q-tip and 91% rubbing alcohol. We're going to use a soft bristle toothbrush to clean some of the dirt and debris away from the main board. While doing this, it's important to be careful because there are many sensitive components that could be damaged. Here's just an example of the dirt and debris that came off this main board that looked relatively clean at the beginning. Here I'm using some low pressure compressed air to clean off anything I missed with the soft bristle brush. Here I'm going to go ahead and remove the cartridge slot. After all of that cleaning, even the compressed air, it's surprising how much dirt and debris remain underneath. Once again, I'm going to gently clean this area with a soft bristle brush. After this, we'll go ahead and spray with 99% IPA. The brown residue you see here, I believe, is just leftover flux from manufacturing. To clean the exterior of the controller ports, we'll use 91% IPA in Q-tips to remove any grime. This part is purely aesthetic. We'll go ahead and clean the internals with electronic cleaner shortly. Here you can see the difference between the clean on the left and the dirty on the right. If there happens to be any particularly stubborn areas, you can go ahead with a magic eraser and scrub those off. Luckily for this project, the rubbing alcohol and the Q-tips seem to do a very good job. We'll use this QD electronic cleaner to clean both the power switch, reset button, all four controller ports, as well as the power and the video connectors in the rear of the console. Once again, we'll use the soft bristle brush in an attempt to clean the pins found within the controller ports. The initial step to cleaning these pins will be once again spraying them out with electronic cleaner. However, I did notice in this process that there appears to be something stuck down within the pins. We'll use this pick to fish out whatever it is that's stuck down in there. I'm guessing the material stuck within the pins is cloth from an old contact cleaning kit. Either way, we have it removed and the pins are good to go. The last step to cleaning, we'll be using a Q-tip and some Windex to clean any dirt and debris from the power lights around. Now it's time to start the reassembly process. We will first reinsert the power lights around into the lower case. That will be followed up by reinstalling the lower expansion port anchors. When reinstalling the lower circuit board tin, it's important to note that there are small plastic locating pins. These will ensure that the part is in place and correctly installed. With those parts in place, we can now go ahead and reinstall the main board. At this point, it is easy to forget to reinstall the AV out bezel, so you want to make sure that that's in place. I did use an electric screwdriver to remove all the screws from this console, but I feel it's important to reassemble using a screwdriver. You should make a habit of always starting the screw counterclockwise to align the threads and then tighten. 
Otherwise, you risk cross-threading or stripping out the plastic. The top mainboard tin is now ready to be installed. We'll follow this up by installing the two longer cartridge port slot screws and then the three screws for the tin on the right hand side and the two on the left. We can now put the expansion port shields back in place in the reverse order in which we remove them. It is now time to slide the heatsink back in place and begin installing the 14 screws which hold it down. When installing the first four screws, it's important to leave these loose as you'll need to be able to align the other 10 screws holding this heatsink to the pads below. Once those are installed, we can go back through and tighten the four screws. Both the power and reset button simply snap into place. And again, here we'll be able to check to verify that the reset button is no longer stuck. One of the final steps to reassembling the upper case will be to install the springs on the cartridge slot doors. It's important to note the orientation of the spring as this tension is what keeps the doors closed when not in use. The door located nearest the back of the console is just a bit longer and the shorter one is installed near the front. And finally, we'll reinstall and tighten the two Phillips head screws for the internal cartridge slot cover. When placing the top of the console case back in place, you'll need to be sure that both the power switch and the power button are either in the on or off position. It's always good at this point to also check that your doors are operational as well as your switches and reset button. Before installing the case screws, we'll go ahead and throw the jumper back in place. When you're reinstalling the case feet, it's important to note that there are four alignment pins, and we'll follow that up with reinstallation of the six game bit screws. Luckily, I had a water damaged parts console laying around, so I was able to salvage lower and upper expansion port doors. As mentioned earlier in the video, if you choose to submerge the lower case for cleaning, you will lose the paper part of the label that contains the barcode and serial number. However, not a big deal. If this information is important to you, you'll just have to hand wash and not submerge the lower case in water. Simply soak the area, let sit a few moments, and here I'll use a plastic pry tool to scrape up any of the residue. I've used this method countless times to remove stickers and residue from other councils. Thanks for watching all the way to the end of the video. If you have any questions or thoughts, feel free to leave them below. I've enjoyed interacting with you guys in the last few videos.